It is Monday, and I hope you had a good weekend, everyone. It's uh, uh, it really does feel like uh, early summer instead of springtime here because it's actually getting it's starting to get warm. Uh, but anyway, I hope you had as pleasant a weekend as I have. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about magical egregores. Now, you know, I'm sure we can find ourselves uh, a pretty good uh, technical uh, definition of uh, egregore. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's not quite a definable term. Now, I don't know about you, but when I walk into, uh, say, like, uh, I, I have visited several uh, cathedrals in Europe. Uh, whenever I visit, my hosts usually take me to a local uh, uh, cathedral, uh, medieval cathedrals, mostly uh, they go they go back just walking in walking through the doors of the cathedrals and most of those cathedral doors actually look like uh, they're, they're trimmed with uh, arched uh, or arched uh, doodad that it, it just looks, you, you have to even think, gee, I'm walking into a big vagina here, okay? Uh, just like the Hebrew letter Daleth, okay? It's a, it's a door. It's a door. Of, it's a door you enter when life begins and a door you come when life is conceived and it's the door you come out of when when you're born it's a perfect thing but when you walk through that threshold and and uh, this cavernous uh, environment opens up to you and you can smell centuries of frankincense incense and the wicks of burning candles and uh, it actually feels the feeling in the room is palpable if you have any sense of sensitivity at all you go wow and you just want to roll your eyes back and be in that space. Now, it's sort of easy to see how energy could be could be uh, uh, generated and worked up and piled up century after century after century, and you feel that that actually has has uh, happened there. It sanctifies you just to be in that environment. And it gives you the idea that anything that you do in that place, it acts as the ear and the eye of the cosmic singularity of uh, uh, every thought, every action, every word is directly heard by, uh, by God. And... Uh, we could kind of look at it scientifically and, and well, you, centuries of doing this one, one ritual, centuries of generation after generation after generation of people coming in here and feeling that have built up this, this thing. And this thing is an egregore, all right? And you, you build up your own little egreg egregores uh, when you live in a house for a long, long time, especially, uh, for instance, the last house Constance and I lived in uh, for 22 straight years, uh, we did uh, uh, Gnostic masses in our living room, 
sacred ceremonies. We did initiations in the house, in the backyard. And uh, we did Monday night magic class where, where people came and learned walking into our house, surrounded by a few doodads, uh, rose cross, stained glass windows and a couple little, you know, cheap statues and things like that. Uh, but it's the people. It's the generations of people that have built up something. And so you can imagine what a shock it was for Constance and I to be so rudely uh, plucked from our egregore and uh, forced to set <laughs> egregoric uh, uh, shop someplace else. And we're still reeling from that. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, New Age people and, and Hindus and, and uh, uh, New Age spoon benders and things like that. They talk about the Akasic records or the Kashic records. And, uh, oh, Yogi Ramacharaka or Panchadasi or whoever William Walker Atkinson is calling himself, uh, wrote nice little pamphlets on the, on the astral world and uh, the Akasic records and things like that. But we don't have to get that mystical. Constance knows that somewhere in some invisible egregore is a storehouse, like in Indiana Jones, the last scene in the, <laughs> in the first Indiana Jones where the Holy Grail is parked in this huge, endless warehouse of things. Well, Constance has a warehouse of every stick of furniture that she's ever known. Her grandmother's furniture, her parents' furniture, any place that she's lived and put her magic into. Our son's toys, every stitch of clothes she's ever, they're neatly they're neatly placed in, in a warehouse that she can just go to. Well, she's not unique. We've all got one of those. That, in a sense, is how we uh, uh, generate uh, miniature egregores around even material objects. And people that uh, are talented and are sensitive enough uh, to perform uh, or exercise their powers of psychometry can pick up can pick up this and go ah oh, I sense a crabby guy sitting in his underpants folding little pieces of cardboard and sticking them together with tape while drinking coffee and listening to the fugs Okay, that in a sense is a little egregore too. Now, let's get down to magical egregores. Why do we learn the uh, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram? Well, lots of reasons, tons of reasons. There's not just one reason that you learn the pentagram ritual. You learn it to train yourself to memorize stuff for the at the for number one. Number two, gets you acquainted with uh, the, the, the concept of invoking and banishing uh, the, the f four main uh, uh, elements or the cosmos as divided into fours. It helps you clear your space. It helps you visualize angels. It helps you understand uh, what those angels are and why they're in that particular place. It just does lots of stuff. But every time you do it, you create a lodge room. You create a circle. You create a universe. And every time you do that, you make that universe more real. 
you implant it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into your magical self. You're creating an egregore. And every ritual that you do and master in that same way, you also do. You're, you're growing. It helps you grow. It helps attune you. Whether you know it or not, it's happening. It ha it's happening in spite of your efforts to believe it's something else. So, uh, I wrote a little thing about the Masonic egregore, okay? Uh, it, it's no secret that, that uh, modern ceremonial magic, lodge room magic, okay, uh, as opposed to house and garden variety uh, uh, magic, personal magic or magic of witchcraft and stuff, it's all real magic, okay? But uh, uh, most modern magicians are studying the work that was done by the 19th century, mostly by 19th century uh, uh, magicians that sort of uh, synthesized uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, about 500 years of other hermetic uh, concepts. Uh, and formulated it into this classic structure of the, the that the golden dawn has left us, and the golden present day golden dawn still operate this. And uh, it seems a little stuffy, especially if you're uh, if you're used to, uh, you know, personal seat of your pants magic. It seems a little uh, and. For 21st century uh, people who are like myself, who are not not patient enough to sit through a bunch of verbose, brilliantly composed, but still goes on and on. Oh, thou who art so so big, and who art this and that, and uh, you know, let's get right, let's just get get right down to magic, you know, but. Uh, most of the, the, the founders of the Golden Dawn uh, were Freemasons, and they were trained as Freemasons, and they were trained as British uh, Freemasons, which uh, 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 is pretty uh, strict and, and anal retentive. <laughs> Uh, even more th than uh, than uh, magnificent work that's done in, in other countries. Okay, these were British, tight ass British Freemasons, and also co-Masons because the Golden Dawn was uh, was uh, uh, co-ed. So, in order for us to understand why. The, the these members of of the uh, golden dawn magical society dealing with angels and spirits and demons and and uh, tarot cards and things like that why they had so much respect indeed they came into their magical uh, creative process as strictly trained Masons. And that when they saw what they were trying to do and compared it to the material that they were steeped in as Masons, they also said to themselves, oh my God, there was so much hermetic magic going on in masonry and we didn't even know it and most masons don't even see how beautiful and how wonderful this uh, uh this is so there was two things going 
they were well trained in masonry, so they structured the, uh, their their golden dawn. And now this bleeds over to the OTO and and things like that. Uh, but it also made them say, oh, gee, masonry itself on an esoteric level is outstanding magic in and of itself. Uh, so I wrote a little thing years and years ago. Uh, uh, in response, it was for a Masonic magazine or something. And I want to share it with you this morning because I've digressed myself into using up most of our time. Uh, so here's what I wrote, and this is how I'll end our Monday thing. The Masonic egregore is an almost tangible presence. As a 14-year-old de Malay, I would sit in the semi-darkness of the lodge room after chapter meetings, almost overcome with reverie. It was so thick, I could cut it. It was easy for me to feel the centuries of floor work and ritual, time and space dissolved as I believed I was sitting in every lodge room on earth in every age of the craft's existence. And in parentheses, I said, I was a strange lad. It felt more sacred than any church I had ever attended. And I hated it when Dad Cooley told me that Get out of here and go home, Lonnie. Thirty-six years later, when I finally took my entered apprentice degree in Freemasonry, now I gotta tell you, I've been twenty-five years in the in the uh, uh, studying magic also before I took my entered apprentice degree in Masonry, so I came into this whole thing uh, already. Uh, with a quarter century of magic under my belt. Okay, 36 later, when I finally took my EA, it all came back to me, only this time more profoundly. When I heard the echoey words, as all those who have gone this way before. When I heard those words, I was struck by lightning. A full-blown mystical experience. I didn't know whether to cry or to giggle or to faint or to die. From that moment forward until the closing of the ceremony, I knew I was an essential part of an infinite machine. Ecstatically installed and locked into the irreversible moving process of creation itself cosmic dynamo that carried me through the doors and to the altar and all around the lodge room. In these timeless moments, all was as it should be. The universe was in perfect order, its components smoothly interacting in harmony like the initiatory and flawlessly trained officers of the ritual. And I wasn't along just for the ride. I was the indispensable key note to that harmony, the essential component in that order. Within the egregore of that tiled lodge room, I realized that without me, at this moment, the cosmos would not be functioning. I, as the candidate, was the star of the show, the protagonist of a drama played out in the centuries-old theater egregore of Freemasonry. And I feel that egregore in every lodge room 
I visit. It's like walking into sacred jello. Okay, that's, that's it for today. Now, believe it or not, I feel that for the last over two years now, we've had these daily get-togethers. To me, these moments on this electronic device continues to create an egregore, a family, an egregore of its own. How are we supposed to take advantage of it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we're supposed to know. But I want to thank you for being part of this magical egregore every morning. So until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.